Well, my name is Jason Schillestrom. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Um, I've been, uh, I, I did my medical school uh, in, uh, here in San Antonio and then residency in psychiatry afterwards. I've done an additional year of geriatric psychiatry fellowship uh, training after that and eventually I graduated and um, am and, and now on faculty at the medical school here in San Antonio. I joined the faculty in uh, July of 2005. Uh, my uh, uh, major jobs are uh, research. Uh, I generally look at uh, the interface between uh, medical illness and uh, cognitive impairments. I have an outpatient geriatric psychiatry clinic at the medical school and then a lot of um, teaching medical students and residents as well. So this morning we're going to talk about um, dementia and we're going to try and understand what is dementia. And so first we're going to uh, describe the diagnostic criteria for dementia and then after that we'll talk about different types of dementia and how different types um, uh, are similar and how the different types are in fact different from each other. Um, we'll speak a little bit about, uh, uh, a very little bit about the, um, uh, uh, the biological changes associated with dementia. And then we'll talk, uh, touch a little bit on um, prevention and treatment. So this morning we're going to, uh, again, we're going to answer the question, what is dementia? And so the first criteria for dementia is that you have to have memory impairment memory impairment. And so there's lots of different types of memory. Um, there's long-term memory, short-term memory, uh, there's verbal memory, there's motor memory. So verbal memory might be, um, you know, for example, people's abilities to remember names and recall recent events. Uh, there's, there's memory tasks such as we'll give people uh, some words to remember and then we'll distract them with the task and then we'll go back to the task and ask them what were those, what were those words we asked them to remember. Uh, yeah, examples of motor memory would be things like, um, uh, or procedural memory might be things like riding a bicycle, for example. You're, 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 even if you haven't ridden a bicycle in years and years and years, uh, chances are you still remember how to do it. When you hop on the bike, you could still go. So to have dementia, you have to have memory impairment. Um, and even if you don't yet have true impairment, having, um, and for some dementia types, having um, decreased memory functioning relative to your previous level of memory functioning um, could still um, meet criteria for this sub-criterion. So you don't necessarily have to be severely impaired. Your memory, even though it may essentially be good, uh, if it's worse than it had been, uh, that can still count. So the first criteria is memory impairment. The second criteria to be diagnosed with uh, dementia is you have to have one of these following um, uh, technical terms. <laughs> so you have to have aphasia or a praxia or agnosia or executive function impairment. Executive function impairment. And so we can talk about what each of these are and, and how we test them. And so, so aphasia is a person's, is, is, aphasia is a loss of, uh, can be thought of as a loss of verbal skills despite having intact um, verbal mental hardware. So people struggle to speak. It's a, it's a, it's a speech impairment. And, and there's different types of aphasia. Most commonly what we'll see is uh, what are called expressive aphasias, we're, we're, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm struggling to get the right words out. And so, um, and so expressive aphasia might be, um, well, examples of an expressive aphasia are we might show a patient a pen, for example, and we might say, you know, what, what is this? 
and the person would, you know, you might say, well, that's a pen. But the person with dementia might say, oh, it's, um, it's one of those things that you write with. It's, 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 it's like a, um, it's a writing instrument. It's, um, and, and it's on the tip of my tongue. I just can't get it. They can't get out pen. Or we might say, you know, what is this right here? And they might say, oh, you, um, it's, it's a clock. Well, well, it's not really a clock. It's, it's like a clock. You, um, you, you tell time. It's, 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 and they can't ever get the word watch out. And so we'll ask our patients with dementia to identify different objects to see if we can elicit the aphasias. Um, another example, another common example where we'll elicit aphasias is to ask them to repeat uh, kind of tricky phrases. And so the one we use most commonly is probably repeat what I say, no ifs, ands, or buts. And the reason we specifically use no ifs, ands, or buts is because um, ifs, ands, and buts are not commonly thought of as nouns. So we're now using these words that are not, they're, they're usually transitional words. They're not nouns. And so people who, um, who have these aphasias, they'll struggle to use these words in this different context. And we'll get, we'll get answers like um, uh, no ifs, no ands, or buts, or no, no, no if, and, and, and but, or, and they'll just struggle to get the words out, no ifs, ands, or buts. So they're struggling to speak. It's a speech problem, but they're not struggling to speak because, um, you know, because the muscles in their larynx don't work, or because their tongue doesn't work, or because, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the pathways going to their musculature don't work. They still have intact speech hardware. They just can't get the right words out. So that's, that would be an example of aphasia. For apraxia, apraxia um, is where a person has impaired motor, uh, impaired motor abilities despite having intact uh, motor hardware. So similar to aphasia, aphasia is a disorder of speech. Um, apraxia is a disorder of uh, motor abilities. And so um, examples where we, where we will uh, test people's motor abilities is we might say, um, I want you to take this piece of paper in your left hand, I want you to fold it in half, and I want you to put it on the floor. And they'll take it, but they'll, they might take it with both hands or the wrong hand, and, and they'll kind of struggle to to fold it in half and it kind of turns into this mess and, and then they might drop it on the floor eventually. But they, they just, they're, they're, they're just not able to manipulate the object like they once were. Um, other examples where we'll try and elicit um, apraxia might be, um, we might ask our patient to show us, you know, I want you to pretend you have a comb in your hand and show me how you would comb your hair. And so someone with apraxia might take their fingers and they might kind of do something like this where they're showing you how they would comb their hair. But that's not how you would use a comb, right? The way you would use a comb is you would pretend to hold a comb and you would, in fact, comb your hair like this, right? And so, um, so again, that's an example of uh, uh, apraxia. Agnosia is a person's... Um, uh, similar to a, agnosia is similar to apraxia. Apraxia is a loss of uh, motor functioning. Aphasia is a loss of speech functioning. Uh, agnosia is a loss of sensory functioning. So a person uh, loses their sensory abilities despite having, again, intact sensory hardware. So examples of, um, of uh, how we might elicit uh, agnosia would be we might put a, uh, have a person close their eyes, and we might put a paper clip or something in their hands, and we would say, tell us what this is. And, and they would struggle to identify, in this case, the paper clip. Commonly, we'll use paper clips or coins, that kind of thing. And, um, and, but, and it's not that they can't feel it. They can, so, so the question isn't, can you feel this? It's not, it's not a, a matter of feeling. It's, it's what is it? You know, can you identify what this is? OK. 